Okay, so welcome everybody to the Intellectual Diversity Podcast. I'm John Tangney, and my guest today is Professor Thomas Main, who is a professor at the uh, School of Public Affairs at Baruch College. At this, uh, is that the City University of New York? City University of New York, yes. Okay, and you have published books on, including, uh, is the American Constitution obsolete? Homelessness in New York City, policy making from Coke to de Blasio, and the book that inspired me to uh, invite you on the podcast, which is this book called The Rise of the Alt-Right. Um, and perhaps we could just begin by talking about your own uh, intellectual background and journey and how you, uh, what, what, is your, what is your educational background and where, how did you come to be interested in this topic? Well, first of all, thanks for, for having me on the podcast. And uh, let's see, um, I uh, came to New York City in the very late 70s, and I had this idea that I was going to be a New York intellectual. And um, it took a while to get that off the ground. Um, but uh, eventually I got uh, a job at a, what was then a popular uh, the political journal, the public interest. And um, I sort of moved in, in what, you know, we, we would be called uh, New York City neoconservative circles. Mm. And um, I was working, I worked for a foundation for a while and occasionally I would have some uh, uh, brush shoulders with people who were, you know, much further to the right of neoconservatives. So, um, but I didn't follow that up much. And really, uh, I only got interested in the alt-right um, when I, I finished uh, my book on the homeless and I looked around for some other topic to get into. And um, somehow I became, you know, I've been a lifelong reader of all sorts of political journals. I uh, became aware of these alt-right sites and was uh, very, very surprised by the radicalism of them. And I decided, Gee, I don't, people people don't appreciate uh, how radical these sites are and uh, and the influence they have, and that's um, that's why I decided to write the book. I see. And um, where do you locate yourself, generally speaking, on the political spectrum? Well, these days I'm I'm pretty much of a, a a moderate, uh, you know, moderately uh, center right. Uh, I uh, I guess you could say I'm a never Trumper. Uh, except that um, I don't really, uh, you know, don't much identify with the Republican Party as it now exists. So uh, I guess I'm, uh, you know, some kind of a radical centrist yeah. or, uh, you know, or, or a moderate uh, center rightist. Okay. Um, one of the things that I appreciated about this book, The Rise of the Alt-Right, was that you make careful distinctions between alt-right and you know, the, uh, the paleo-conservatives and the neoconservatives. Yeah, there are some useful distinctions that can be made. Um, I'd say the alt-right is, is, is something, is a new sort of phenomenon. It's uh, different from the, um, uh, you know, traditional far-right groups like neo-Nazis and KKK. They, uh, you know, they're really uh, quasi-criminal organizations almost. Uh, the alt-right is, uh, is an ideological movement. They have a distinct ideology. Um, they're, you know, and the thing that distinguishes them from traditional conservatives and the way you can tell the difference between the alt-rightists and uh, uh, various other formations on the right, traditional right, is that the alt-rightists seem to be, uh, you know, reject liberal democracy in principle. Mm -hmm. uh, they and and in fact most of the uh, the principles that uh, uh, traditional American conservatives accepted, like capitalism, especially the alt right is not uh, um, um, is not uh, enthusiastic about. And and I think also when when you look at the alt right, there are gradations of opinion. There are some very radical sites which are close to being neo Nazi, like let's say the Daily Stormer, and then there are others that uh, almost uh, come within uh, hailing distance of the traditional right. I would put V there, there somewhere. But the, the key thing that all of the, that the alt-right uh, shares and that distinguishes them from the traditional rightists is 
they, for the most part, they they very openly say we don't believe all people are created equal. Boom. They reject Jeffersonian egalitarianism, and that until very recently, that was a very unusual position to see people anywhere on the American right wing occupying. And you have outlined in this book uh, a, a kind of a genea an intellectual genealogy of the alt-right that goes back to the turn of the 20th century. Can, can you summarize that genealogy? Well, I can, you know, you can go back even further. If you, if, 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 you know, a key moment in uh, the genealogy of the right in the United States was the creation of uh, the National Review by William Buckley in 1955. Um, and what basically what Buckley did is uh, he defined um, something, you know, a, 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 a right wing that was not fundamentally opposed to liberal democracy. And he threw out and refused to publish in his journal anybody who was openly anti Semitic. Uh, early on, there were a couple of unfortunate articles about pro segregation. Eventually, Buckley threw out people who were openly racist anti-Semitic, uh, who uh, openly uh, rejected democracy. And so he created uh, a, uh, a right wing that, you know, could fit into the American political spectrum somehow. And, um, and, and so there, there were people to the right of that, and they were known as right wing extremists. Hmm. And they, they held on by their fingertips for a long time. They never entirely went away. Hmm. Um, but um, what happened is, I think if, if things started to change radically by the turn of the millennium. Um, the American political system gets hit with a lot of crises, like 9-11, um, uh, and then later on the um, uh, financial crisis of 2008, and then there is the Iraq war, and then there is visible demographic change and so forth. We get hit, so that, that kind of undermines the status of, uh, of uh, respectable conservatives who had now come into some power in Washington. So that happened. And also the other thing that happened is um, the internet, which provided a very low cost, cost way of reaching mass audiences. And previously the uh, far right groups, whether you call them right wing extremists or paleo conservatives or later on the alt right, uh, it, it used to be that they didn't have the resources uh, to uh, compete with outlets like National Review. So now all of a sudden they did. And so this movement, uh, which had been um, hanging on by its fingertips, uh, now got a chance to go, you know, go for a larger audience. And they found more people willing to listen because of the shakeup uh, that the American political system had gone through. So that's, that, that would mark sort of the takeoff. Uh, the crystallization, you might say, of the alt-right between 2000 2016. I see. But you, 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 uh, in addition to this, uh, this genealogy that you just described uh, with regard to William F. Buckley, you also, um, I, the, the, the name of the writer uh, has just gone out of my head, but you, just, you, you talked about this writer uh, from the turn of the 20th century, uh, who was then taken up by uh, people like Paul Gottfried in... Oh, uh, Francis? Samuel yes. Francis? Yes. yes. Uh, Francis was, um, let's see, he was a paleoconservative, mm. and um, he uh, worked for the Washington Times, which was a, a right-wing newspaper that was established by the Unification Church. And he took a position... Uh, to the to the right of the neoconservatives, so he was a paleoconservative, and as time went by, he became more and more radical. Uh, eventually, he at the Washington Times dismissed him for uh, making comments that were thought to be uh, racist, uh, and and I think in fact were racist. Um, and um, he uh, wrote uh, a began. A, finished in 1995 a book, a magnum opus, which was kind of the great theoretical uh, volume of the paleoconservatives or of the alt-right. It's been called the Das Kapital of the alt-right. And that was uh, Leviathan and its enemies. And yes, I would say now he didn't, it didn't get published until around 2015. He kept it under wraps. 
But he continued writing his columns and continued getting his ideas out. And uh, so yeah, in one way, he was one of the progenitors of uh, the alt-right and sort of worked out in some detail um, a uh, uh, right-wing um, attack on not only a neoconservatism, which he hated mainstream Republicans, but liberal democracy in general. Okay, and and then he he became a kind of, a kind of Karl Marx figure for people like Gottfried, uh, who then for, formed the link with the alt right uh, in the early twentieth century. Uh, something like you know, Gottfried was uh, was uh, a, a, a longtime colleague and friend of Francis. Mm. Uh, Gottfried was uh, an academic. Uh, uh, Francis had a PhD but uh, didn't teach. Gottfried uh, uh, was an academic. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, and was in general more academic and, and less polemical than um, than uh, Francis, but they both came to the conclusion that um, liberal democracies uh, in the you know by the late twentieth early twenty first century were um, essentially um, soft totalitarian despotisms. Yes, that uh, there was um, a, a managerial elite had gotten to the top and ran everything. And, um, and this managerial elite stayed in power by deliberately accelerating the pace of social change and disrupting traditional communities and then sort of moving in with social programs to take the place uh, that these traditional communities used to um, uh, occupy. Uh, so that was basically, one could go into detail about how the different uh, analyses. Um, but uh, yeah, I, but I think it's you know it's fair to say that uh, they both came to the conclusion that uh, liberal democracy you know really was essentially a fraud, and that uh, some kind of really fundamental and in, in, in Fran Francis seems to have believed that there was a need for a nearly apocalyptic kind of shakeup of the system, uh, so that you know a kind of uh, how would one put it? Uh, uh, I, I think it's not too much to say that, 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 that the vision behind both of them is in a certain sense fascist. Uh, 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 Gottfried wrote a book on the history of the concept of fascism, which is basically comes very close to being an endorsement of uh, what he calls generic fascism, Mussolini's brand of fascism. So uh, yes, between the two of them, they, they sort of developed in a, a, this uh, uh, what might be called a generic fascist, uh, uh, an, an American uh, Americanized version of that of that particular ideology. And you talk in the book about different managerial elites, a soft and a hard managerial elite. And yeah. is that distinction the same, or in any way aligned with the distinction between, say, Democrats and Republicans? Or no, no. It, now here's here's the, here's. Uh, the theory that was developed especially by Francis. Uh, Francis, borrowing from um, uh, James Burnham, who was one of the, also one of the founders of the National Review, yes. argued that all advanced societies had been taken over by their bureaucracies, the, by the managers. Right? Um, and he, he felt it, 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 that, that there was really um, there were shades of difference and, and, and shades of intensities amongst uh, different uh, managerial regimes, but he felt that in essence, there wasn't fundamentally any difference between uh, New Dealism or what we would now call liberalism or progressivism mm -hmm. and uh, fascism and Stalinism. You saw these all as being regimes where bureaucrats had gotten to the top and ran everything. Um, so uh, the um, Francis basically picks that up, okay, and um, goes much further with it than um, Burnham did. Uh, Francis uh, boldly steps forward and says, "Hey, you know what? Uh, by the early, late twentieth century, um, you know, there's, there's hardly a dime's worth of difference between the hard managerial regimes." which yeah. were uh, fascists and Stalinists, and then the soft managerial regimes. There was that, that difference in intensity. The soft regimes, um, well, the hard regimes 
uh, uh, governed through basically through force and compulsion and coercion. And the soft regime, regimes of the democratic West uh, govern through advertising and manipulation and suasion and buying off. And you know, you might be inclined to say, well, hey, maybe that's all the difference in the world. You know, some places, you know, they, they rule by cracking heads, and other places they rule by making arguments and paying people off and so forth. To Francis, his thought was this was all one. You know, it's pretty much the same stuff. It's just a milder version of it in the West. And so both of these systems are inherently totalitarian. That was the analysis he came with. And that, and so therefore, the hard managerial regimes and the soft managerial regimes, the hard regimes were the openly totalitarian and violently repressive regimes of the Stalinists and the fascists. And then liberals had their own form of repression, which is very much kind of, it's, it's, it, it, Francis basically buys into the concept that uh, Marcuse developed of repressive tolerance. The whole democratic structure of the West is really basically a big trick by the, uh, the managers to impose their rule on the rest of us. Yeah, I was very interested in this affinity that you noticed between the, the paleo conservatives and, the, and, and critical theory, critical theorists like Marcuse. Yes. And, uh, it's something that I've also noticed in people uh, who have alt-right sympathies uh, in my circle of acquaintance on social media. Yes. And I, I wonder what you make of this affinity. Uh, what does it say about the left? Well, uh, let's see. I think what I would say is this. Um, the alt-right, their progenitor might be said to be uh, great-grandfather, might be said to be Burnham. And mm -hmm. Burnham... Uh, and, and where does Burnham get his ideas from? Burnham gets his ideas from a, a school of reactionary thought known as the uh, elite theorists, uh, people like Michels, people like Pareto, okay? And their argument basically was, uh, they, they developed a kind of an argument that was often known as the futility argument. Hey, try to change society, and the result is nothing happens. It's just why, because social forces are so overwhelming, you can't manage them. So if you try to redistribute, wealth doesn't work. You know, the, the markets and individual differences put everybody back where they started off. And similarly, democracy doesn't work. Why? Because there's always an elite that rules, no matter what you do. Well, uh, okay, so, so in one way, if, that's a conservative argument if you want to preserve the status quo, right? Because then you say the status quo is invincible, therefore stop trying. But um, uh, Francis and Gottfried were so disgusted with the liberal status quo that they found themselves in a pro If you really believe that uh, or political action is futile and you don't like the status quo, you've now painted yourself into a corner, right? So what you need now is some kind of a vision of a cataclysmic force that's from the outside that's going to come along and uproot everything. So at that point, right, they begin to, the, the alt-rightists begin to see a certain amount of affinity with the far left and with Marcusa. Marcusa, you get this uh, also an account of um, you know, liberal democratic society, which is essentially totalitarian. And then the, the, and Marcuse in One Dimensional Man ends by suggesting, oh, you, you know, what's going to happen is the people who are completely outside, the outsiders of society, the lumpen proletariat, are going to rise up and you get this kind of dark suggestion there's going to be some kind of cataclysmic confrontation that will result in, well, God knows what, but it's just something better. You know, this is like the old new left idea of, you know, we'll burn the system down and then something better will come up out of its ashes. Well, uh, the alt-right people like Francis and, and Gottfried start buying into this, right? And therefore they find an affinity on the, uh, the far left, um, which is expressed, uh, uh, but uh, Gottfried especially, but also Francis, become involved with a political group that edited a journal known as Telos. Uh, and Telos is a far, far left, new, new left organization that starts to become interested in people like uh, Carl Schmitt, 
<laughs> and so you see this, this, this is like the horseshoe theory of the political spectrum. You see this coming together of left and right. And the point is anybody who is, has got in his heart this desire, a longing for a total revolution ends up in the same boat eventually. Yeah. You name-checked Francis Fukuyama a few times in the book and uh, his end of history theory. And I remember at the end of that book, one of the things that he suggests might undo the neoliberal end of, end of history is, is boredom. And I wonder if this longing for apocalypse is in any way, you know, uh, born out of boredom with... Yes, I think, there's, I think, there's, something I think there's something to that. Um, let's see. I think... Um, um, well, let's, let, let, let's see. Um, there's boredom. There's also this uh, feeling that liberal democracies are, you know, they're operating, let's say, at best on a sub-optimal uh, level, right? Um, it's clear uh, pluralistic politics uh, has trouble producing public goods. It has trouble redistributing uh, resources. It has a lot of other troubles. This is especially true in the United States where we've got a constitutional structure that deliberately encourages and incentivizes uh, the growth of interest groups and factions, right? And that's supposed to be great because that keeps us free. No, so many, all these different interest groups, nobody has too much power. How wonderful, um, the, which is true. But the problem is then bringing together these factions uh, uh, for uh, purposes of uh, uh, important uh, collective action turns out to be difficult. So um, I would say that especially in the United States, that uh, our liberal democratic regime, which, you know, principles of which I, I think are well established and well worth uh, fighting for, but the, it, the operation has been so optimal. And so besides boredom, I would say there are some people who uh, the political system is uh, not uh, catering to as effectively as, they, as it might. Uh, it's been known for a long time that some groups have an easier time organizing than others, right? Um, and uh, people like, used to be said, the, the lumpen proletariat and the poor, and now the argument is also that uh, the white working class isn't you know, able to uh, organize as well, and they get screwed by uh, well-organized uh, interests. So you have boredom, you have suboptimal performance of the liberal democracies, and th those. Would be, and also, I think we have the you know when the Soviet Union collapses, mm. right? All of a sudden, all of there's a whole lot of moderate reforms that the right used to buy into, like civil rights mm. and like uh, immigration. And like even capitalism, and all of that looked good when you were uh, competing with uh, communists. You could say, "Hey, capitalism causes growth. Where's your growth? Hey, we, you know, we're not racists. We have civil. Well, that was it, 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 when the Soviet Union went away. You didn't need to protect your left flank, and therefore, um, it, the, the collapse of, of communism. I think it did for a while lead to this." a period of about 15 years where everybody said, oh, there's really no alternative to liberal democracy. But I think as a matter of fact, one has now uh, coalesced and partly it's because the people who are on the far right now feel emboldened uh, to you know, uh, cease protecting their left flank and uh, go right all the way. Okay. Okay, so, so um, we've kind of covered the uh, the, the, the history of the alt-right from Burnham to Marcuse to Francis to, uh, and Gottfried. And how do we then get from those guys to people like uh, Jared Taylor and uh, Richard Spencer uh, and those yeah. people who have the prominence in the, in the early 21st century? Well, I guess I would say, you know, a couple of things happen. Uh, one is, as I say, the development of the internet. Right. So, uh, in, in the old days, somebody like, let's say, Richard Spencer, mm -hmm. you know, who, um, you know, he worked uh, for a while for a, a right-wing magazine called uh, Tacky's Magazine. Um, but, um, let's see, you know, he, when, when, when he moved to the far right, to the paleo right, to the radical right, 
Uh, well, if that had happened in the 60s or 70s or 80s, you know, maybe he would have been able to start up a small journal, but you know, it wouldn't have gone very far. So now he could go online and it was much cheaper. And so, and, and, and for instance, uh, Jared Taylor, Jared Taylor is rather different. He had been around longer. He, um, he had a traditional magazine, hard copy magazine, the American Renaissance, which started up, I think, in 1990. And he managed to keep that going somehow or other, but it never made a big impact. Uh, and then when he discovered the internet, internet, all of a sudden, you know, he was able to take his ideas um, and find a much larger audience. And I, and I think that the fact that it, 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 we had the internet, which, you know, uh, gave people a platform, mm. you had the, uh, the end of the necessity of American conservatives and American society, liberal society in general, the end of its need to protect its left flank, flank against communism. You had a series of uh, political uh, crises starting from 9-11 and going through the Iraq war and the uh, fiscal crisis and immigration and much else. Um, and that shook up people and made them start thinking, hey, you know, maybe we need a new um, uh, um, conventional wisdom. And also it, it, that, that shakeup of the conventional wisdom happened when mainstream conservatives were in power, the Bush administration. So um, the result is that the mainstream conservatives get wounded and all of a sudden the people who are on the uh, right uh, finally see a window of opportunity and that's where people like um, Richard Spencer and then I would also say, uh, let's see, there's another uh, uh, um, alt-right outlet called Occidental Dissent uh, and uh, let me see, I'm trying to remember the name of, of its uh, uh, editor, uh, Hunter Wallace. He goes by the pet, pet name of Hunter Wallace and there were others and it was in that environment uh, that moment, that window of opportunity where, where these people came along and they took some of the ideas that had been developed by Gottfried, by Francis and others and started uh, uh, boiling them down for mass dissemination. I see. Uh, you interviewed a few of these people and, you know, I, I met Richard Spencer once because he was a, a graduate student in, at Duke at the same time yeah. as me. And I went to uh, an event organized by the Duke Conservatives in which Peter Brimelow of uh, VDARE website uh, debated a liberal about the question of immigration. And, you know, Duke at that time was you know, uh, filled with very aggressive left-wing activism uh, yeah. because it was the era of the Duke lacrosse case. And I wonder in your, I, I don't, I didn't know Spencer at all, but um, I was just in his company that one time, but I, uh, I, I often wondered afterwards, you know, to what extent he had been radicalized by the the atmosphere at Duke and the kind of hostility towards conservatives at Duke at that time. And do you have any sense of whether these people become radicalized or how do they become, how do they develop their affinity for the alt-right? Well, uh, you know, I think, well, let me spin out a theory for you. I'm going to try to uh, keep it brief. Um, um, it is sometimes said that the alt-right uh, was, uh, uh, is borrowing some of the techniques of postmodernists, mm -hmm. And I think there is something to that. What, what, not, not a whole lot, but something. Because I think that um, uh, um, in, amongst postmodernists, uh, amongst uh, critical theorists like Marcuse, also amongst a relatively uh, mainstream intellectual movement, um, uh, feminist epistemologists who mm. developed something known as standpoint theory. Yes. Yes. There was this theory that, hey, um, um, here we have uh, a society which, uh, and, 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 and these, these various schools of thought buy into the idea that, yes, a kind of a, they oftentimes don't use the term totalitarian, but a kind of like an intellect, interlocking directorate of interests and opinions forms in Western democracies. And that's bad, right? Because what, when, what's needed is to democratize science, democratize society. You know, it is it, the argument that science and politics, uh, it requires people to have uh, similar opinions, similar ways of thinking. Well, what happens if those opinions 
become so set and so fixed that the people who hold them don't, don't even recognize that they're making assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that could lead to trouble. Therefore, you have to move to the margin. People who are on the margin, like women, like minorities, um, are in a position to offer critical distance on the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine as far as it goes. You know, and there's something to that, certainly. And then one day, somebody wrote an essay around 2011 and said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the mainstream of liberal democratic society can get to usefully criticize from the margin, and if we actually ought to facilitate criticism from the margins, hey, wait a second. Aren't Nazis marginal? Answer, yes. Therefore, doesn't this boil down to saying that we've got to facilitate critique of liberal democracy from the Nazi perspective? Well, now, of course, the, the, the postmodernists, the critical theorists, the, the, the feminists never wanted to say anything like that. But I think what happened is the alt-right, without necessarily borrowing directly from those sources, they do borrow directly from some, but not all. The alt-right came up with this idea, hey, if we can sell ourselves as an, a minority or, 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 or as marginal, if we can sell ourselves as marginal, if we can show, for instance, at, at Duke, right, that, hey, Duke has take, been taken over by uh, this homogeneous uh, left-wing climate of opinion, right? So, gee, if we can demonstrate that we're marginal to that and we're outside of that, that'll give us a critical distance, and then we will, working with the assumptions of our critics, they will have to say, you know, golly, you've got to listen to these people. So I think that what this, now, now I'm not saying that this consciously played out in anybody's mind, mm -hmm. but I think the result was that many, many people on the right hit on the idea, hey, I will marginalize myself by saying the nastiest loudest, uh, most vulgar things, most uh, counterintuitive things, and then everybody on the left will jump up and be shocked, you know, and that'll prove to me and to anybody else who is, you know, in my orbit that, hey, we're the marginal people. We are the subalterns. We are the people that have the real critical distance on, on uh, liberal uh, democracy. And so I think that, um, in a, in a, put it this way, I, I, I'm an academic. I have never found political correctness on American campuses to be so stultifying as, you know, I've, I've had a perfect, I, I, I was a neoconservative for a long time, still have right-wing propensities, hasn't stopped me from getting somewhere. Um, but I do think that, uh, that perhaps insofar as, as there is this politically correct atmosphere, it does perhaps encourage some people to deliberately marginalize themselves from it, and that makes them feel like they've got critical distance on it. Do you think that you, the, the fact that you've never found political correctness to be oppressive on campuses has anything to do with the particular discipline you, you work in? I don't know about the particular discipline. I'm a political scientist. I, I teach at uh, Baruch College, City, City University of New York. Um, it's not an elite school like Duke. Um, you know, it's, it's a good school. Most of the people here are, um, they're, they're, they're looking. My mother went to this, uh, one of the city uh, universities. She went to Queens College back in the 50s. And like my mother, most of the people here, uh, it's a very diverse population, people from all over the world, people of many different ethnicities and orientations and such. Basically, they're here for utilitarian purposes. And um, they're you know, they're not much interested in uh, scoring points ideologically. And for that reason, I think it's uh, a very, you know, non-PC sort of, it, 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 when I say it's non-PC campus atmosphere, I don't mean to say that it's conservative. I simply mean most of the people here are, you know, are not, not terribly ideological. And so I, I get along, you know, quite well. Okay, yeah, so do you think that's quite different from how things are on many, if not most, campuses in the U.S.? Possibly. Um, I, my friends who teach at elite universities, you know, have seem to have, uh, see the situation there as being a more stultifying than I find here. 
But I think I think the main thing is I think the main thing is this. You know, political correctness is is a phenomenon. You know, you could you could point to it. And 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 in a way, you might say, right, that um, uh, this this uh, theory of uh, that the margins have an epistemological privilege, mm. right? Early on, that was developed on the left, and so that does encourage a kind of a a, a PC attitude because it, it, once again, it encourages people to take a a, a marginal position and then to kind of and see the big question is this. How do you prove your margin? Yeah. Right. So if you say, "Oh, I'm a woman. I'm black." Well, that's not good enough because maybe you were born into the system. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if being marginal gives you an epistemological advantage, you need some concrete way of showing your marginal. And one way to do that is to kind of uh, critique and, and 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 demonstrate that you are separate from and alienated from the mainstream. I, so that, I think the mild version of that results in something like political correctness. Yeah. And then what happens is the right wing buys into it, figures it out, and weaponizes it, uh, supercharges it, uh, turbocharges it, and you get this uh, deliberate attempt to kind of create a, a, a bubble world. And the bubble, you know, a world that is so... Uh, a critical and so alienated from the mainstream that uh, you know your, your your credentials as being marginal and therefore critical or indisputable at least to yourself and this this ideological bubble I think that the right has run much further with it than the left ever did and I think this the, this this bubble or this monad of, uh, uh, of, of, of of marginalizing rightist rhetoric, you can see it goes all the way from um, from um, the Daily Stormer, and then there are gradations of it, and the, you know the soft versions of it are on, are to be found on Fox. So personally, I found uh, the uh, the rhetoric, the radicalization on the far right. I think that's more of a threat to uh, academic. Um, um, of course, to the intellectual life. I think that's more of a right-wing um, anti-intellectualism, right-wing bubble thinking is, I think, more of a threat to a healthy liberal democratic culture than is the PC at this point. Yeah. Um, I've read recently that something like 95% of the professoriate on American college campuses vote democratic or yeah. left of there. And, and that to me means that you know roughly 50 percent of the american population doesn't have any real representation among the professoriate on campus and it suggests to me that the kind of grievance culture among uh people who are liberal or leftist um is is fairly hegemonic within the educational system but the kind of grievances that people people not necessarily even on the on the alt right or the far right but people on the moderate right uh, feel um, is, is a little bit more justified than some of the sense of being marginalized that people feel on the left at least within within universities well you know I'm, I'm, I'm writing about this now about uh, the, the the climate of opinion in liberal democracies these days mm -hmm. on campus and amongst intellectuals. So I, I, I you know, my thoughts are still forming on this. Mm -hmm. um, my, I think that the political correctness is a problem, but I also think, you know, I, I think what, what happened is there was a period of time when the academy developed a, a clear uh, right wing. That was uh, in, the, in the wake of the uh, disturbances of the 60s and through much of the 70s into the mid 80s, you saw the development of, um, uh, of right-wing uh, academics. You know, there was the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, I, I took uh, classes with, uh, you know, uh, James Q. Wilson, who was, you know, a very distinguished political scientist, uh, you know, uh, often known as a neoconservative. And there were others. So there were neoconservatives on campus, right? But uh, I so, so so but that that uh, that uh, community doesn't really exist anymore on campus. I think one of the reasons why 
is the right wing um, uh, decided that instead of um, uh, trying to encourage uh, people to go into the academy uh, and to uh, learn how to be objective and professional academics, right, first, and then if you had, you know, if you came to right-wing conclusions, hey, what was wrong with that? You, you earn them, you got to it, right? And, and, you, and you would, you know, and if somebody said boo you, you would stand your ground and say, hey, I did the work, let me, let's, let's have a discussion. So I think that it, instead of developing that strategy, uh, the right wing started to develop an alternative world to the academy of think tanks and publications and then later on blogs and organizations. And, there, and for a while that looked like there was something to it. The idea was, hey, we've already got these very interesting academics doing all sorts of interesting work. What we'll do with these new think tanks, they'll be more, commun they'll be more communications oriented they will boil down this scholarly work and communicate it, get it into the bloodstream of the body politic. Well, what happened after uh, not too long is that, you know, the, this, the, the right wing scholarship, real scholarship dried up and the think tanks turned into uh, not much more than, uh, uh, you know, there was, there was very little research being done in them. And so I think that the, the right made a mistake when they decided you know, to retreat from the, the academy and uh, try to create a parallel universe. I think that's kind of drawn off a lot of talent. And I think that some of the talent that would have gone into uh, the university system has, uh, you know, conservative talent has now been drawn off. And I think that's, that's probably bad for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting because um, it's, Similar and yet contrary to the argument that's often made from the right that the universities have become kind of uh, um, generators of liberal and left wing ideology and that there's very little real research being done, perhaps not in political science, but certainly in the humanities, you know, that there's not. A, and I would argue this myself that in a discipline like my own, such as which is English literature. There's not a whole lot that deserves the name of research being done there, but there's a lot of theory-driven uh, ideology uh, being pushed at students and, and that, you know, the yeah. critique you just made of the think tanks could equally be made of English departments. Well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a political scientist. I know about the political science. I, I can't say much about the state of the uh, humanities. My sense is, uh, you know, I've heard this line, oh, there's no good research coming out of the departments of political science and sociology and economics at places like Harvard and Yale and Chicago. Is that true? Uh, no, I don't think that's true. I think, like for, for instance, if you, if you look at the writings of alt-rightists, mm. uh, where they develop this theory that uh, America is ruled by an oligarchy, right? Mm. It's pretty thin stuff. Uh, you know, from an academic analytic uh, point of view. Now, if you really want to find a good analysis of not so much the oligarchic propensities of American politics, but the, but the, but the rise of uh, a very small number of very rich people who have outside influence, uh, that work is coming from uh, mainstream political science departments, right? And you know, the, the alt-right sometimes points to it and says, ha, ah, this proves our, you know, they're saying what we're saying, but they're really not. Uh, and the result, uh, and I think that, uh, listen, if you were talking about social science research, right, the immense majority of first-rate stuff comes out of academia and then to a certain, extent, and some think tanks like Brookings and a couple of others, and then there's some work also done by in, by the federal government, but is you know it, it, it is 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 and their work being done by these uh, right wing think tanks that you know uh, that from an intellectual and analytical point of view is vastly superior to the work that's coming out of Chicago or Yale or Stanford. Uh, no, that's not true. Yeah. Don't kid yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You 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 describe a, a 
a, food, a kind of a, a, a food ch chain of ideas or an ideas food chain yes. the, yes. And, and at the top of this food chain the the kind of apex predator is the uh, the academic technocratic expert uh, and neg and below him is the the kind of wide-ranging into intellectual okay. and then below them is maybe you know me media pundits who interpret the work of intellectuals to the public and then there's the ordinary oh, people. Pretty worse. Yes. And and you said that one you pointed out that one of the uh, well one of the groups that uh, you know has had a kind of a rocky road from the time of the uh, the move to the right of the academy following 1968 is is the the intellectual part of the food chain. Yes. And and maybe that they've en enjoyed a resurgence uh, in the era of the internet because they can do things independently of. Uh, the gatekeepers who used to keep them out of the intellectual world and you know th there are a lot of people who would say that uh, the demise of the intellectual in the age of academe is actually a bad thing and that you know the absence of these generalists who provide this mediating uh, who, who role between experts and the media um, has been to the detriment of the the kind of intellectual pluralism of um, of society do you see Yes, I would, I would agree with that. I think that what happened is, um, you know, Hayek says that intellectual, intellectuals are secondhand dealers in ideas. Mm. They take uh, the, 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 the scientific, the, the really expert work, with, uh, and they boil it down and they, uh, they simplify it somewhat and they apply it to more specific areas, right? And that's, that's, that's the role of the intellectual. Uh, and um, um, the um, and, and intellectuals sort of act as, as gatekeepers. Now, when I talk about intellectuals, I mean much. Uh, if, if you read, uh, for example, Russell Jacoby's book on the last intellectual, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah he, he seems to think that the only people who really count as intellectuals are people who uh, independent writers who lived in Greenwich Village. You know, and wrote for little magazines, and he yeah. kind of lament. Now, I don't think that's I, I, anybody who uh, occupies that position between uh, experts and the broader public, and who uh, uh, interprets, applies ideas. Uh, anyone like that is an intellectual. So that can that includes the traditional intellectuals, but also people like editors, uh, publishers, and teachers, and so forth. So um, what happened is, you know, if you think of editors, you know, as a type of intellectual, right? Uh, you think of newspaper editors too, and book publishers as, you know, being intellectuals. Well, they determined, you know, who got access to the newspapers and to the books. And in those days, printing a newspaper, printing a book was a, a capital intensive industry. And so it was relatively easy for the gatekeepers to keep some people out. They'd say, hey, we're publishing your book, but not your book. You know, and the book that didn't get published, you know, it went, just went nowhere. Well, now what happens is uh, the book that didn't get published because the intellectuals thought, hey, this is racist, or, you know, alternative, this is, you know, this is communist, or it's just no good, or it's just too vulgar. So what, what happens to that stuff? Instead of going into somebody's drawer or tr trash can, they take it onto the internet. And so, so I think the internet uh, uh, has uh, undermined the position of intellectual gatekeepers, of filters. And I think that's basically uh, has been, for the most part, uh, negative for um, uh, democratic uh, deliberation, uh, intellectual discourse, uh, because you have now had this gush of uh, uh, extremist, vulgar, uh, inaccurate, mendacious, nonsensical. I mean, we're not, we're not talking just about opinions that, oh, you know, that sounds, you know, you're against affirmative action. Oh, that might offend a, in a black person. No, we're not talking about things like that. We're talking about bizarre things like QAnon, which I guess you're familiar with. No. And, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a bizarre conspiracy theory. Uh, that is that there's supposedly there's this this guy Q who is in the midst of the Trump White House and he, Trump is part of this he's the leader of the anti hegemonic forces and so so well, the point the point about QAnon is the whole thing is ridiculous right and in the old days would have never gone anywhere 
right? Except now the people into it have got access to the internet. And so I think there's been a terrible uh, uh, decline in the quality of uh, political journalism, political dialogue uh, in American society in general, and especially on the right. I mean, the days when I remember the late 70s, early 80s, you had uh, many distinguished editors, uh, uh, writers, you know, intellectuals, scholars on the right, plying their trade. Um, that's all gone now because why? Because, well, because uh, Bill Buckley's strategy of throwing the kooks out doesn't work anymore because the kooks, the anti-Semites and the racists, instead of just disappearing, they start their own magazine and you can't shut them up. Okay. So, uh, you, yeah. So, so that kind of leads me to, uh, to, to talk about the alt-light and the, yeah. uh, the, the, the part of your book where you, uh, you make the distinction between the alt-right and the alt-light. And, yeah. you know, the alt-right for you is kind of people to the right of Breitbart, maybe. Yeah, um, I would say, yeah. yeah. Well, the key, the key difference is, I, people, you know, one bright-line distinction is mm. alt-right people, by and large, for the most part, boldly step forward and say, no. All people are not created equal. They're very firm about it. And sometimes there, there are certain variations and so forth, uh, but for the most part, they, they reject uh, political uh, egalitarianism, right? And that very easily leads into a kind of a rejection of liberal democracy as a whole, okay? Uh, and they're explicit about that for the most part. Sometimes the, the alt-right is. Now, in the alt-light, um, like Breitbart, you, if you go to Breitbart and you look and you try to find people who say, hey, we're not all created equal, you don't find, you find very few people saying that explicitly, all right? Uh, so what you do find, though, is, you know, the, the, more, the, the most overt, uh, 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 open expressions of liberalism are removed, right? But what remains is the whole uh, marginalizing tone, the whole um, effort to uh, 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 develop a kind of a corrosive um, uh, rejection, a corrosive negativism towards uh, what is seen as uh, the mainstream. And when the, the mainstream, of course, is characterized as uh, anybody who is liberal. Well, but then, of course, liberalism expands, and it turns out that even people like the Bushes get counted as liberals and so forth. So, um, so in, in Breitbart, you have, you know, the tone, the marginalizing rhetoric, the, um, the, the strategy of uh, distancing oneself uh, from the mainstream. Uh, however, and you don't get explicit public statements of the ideology, hmm. but when you start poking and you look at some of the things that, for instance, Bannon would talk about uh, when he, in private, right? And for instance, when he spoke to the uh, uh, a, a group uh, uh, at, at the, it wasn't a, a Vatican group, he spoke to them at the Vatican. And then it turns out that, uh, oh, you know, the, the thinkers that he is drawing on are people like Jules Zavola and Alexander Dugan. These people are radically illiberal, right? Yeah. So one gets the impression that uh, Breitbart is uh, drawing inspiration. You know, the deep structure of Breitbart is fundamentally illiberal, but uh, you know, all of the, you know, the, 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 the things that are, uh, you know, un, unsuitable for, for, for truly mass consumption don't get said explicit, explicitly. And what remains is the, is the polarizing uh, a nihilistic tone, and that's I think what you find on the on the old light. Yeah. So you don't think that maybe uh, Bannon's name checking of Evola and Dugan, at, you know, which was which happened quite a long time ago, fifteen twenty years ago, I think. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it could be. I know, but well, you know, it's uh, no, I don't. I don't think that was a, that was a coincidence. I mean, by the way, I, I, after I wrote the book, I came. Someone came across a collection of emails. Mm -hmm. um, uh, between uh, Bannon and Milo, who was one of his uh, uh, provocateurs. Yeah. Uh, and um, Bannon was sending emails to Milo saying, 
oh, I like to, you know, you managed to work in, you managed to mention Jules Evola. That's yeah. good. Okay. So I think that, um, I think this, you, you know, if you put it this way, right? If, if back in the 80s, right? If you went to a uh, national review, uh, a meeting of national review editors, you'd see a lot of people wearing Adam Smith neckties. Hmm. So does that mean that all of them read Adam Smith? Does that mean all of them were, were laissez-faire purists? No, but it gives you some kind of a sense as to you know, what they thought that would, their intellectual milieu was, okay? Yeah. So now with uh, Bannon, right? Okay, so Bannon's not wearing Jules Evola ties, but, 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 but you know, the fact that he's not talking about it in public, although it does come up in private, suggests even more than wearing a necktie Hey, this is this is the Jamel you know, Yu. This is the this is the, the the intellectual climate that dare not speak its name. And I and I do I think that that's there. And also I, I do accept um, the uh, the account that was given by Ronald Radosh that uh, Bannon once described himself as a Leninist. So yes, I do think there is underneath this is a quite radical rejection of liberal democracy on the part of the alt right excuse me, on the part of the old light, but it is leavened, tempered, pulls in its horns somewhat. And that's the main distinction. Okay, so when you talk about Evola and Dugan as being the intellectual affinity that dare not speak its name, uh, that uh, Bannon doesn't allow into his, uh, uh, his, his public discourse very much. Um, you know, I wonder why it is that we're not allowed to speak about these far right thinkers, and yet it's perfectly acceptable to describe yourself as a Maoist or a Leninist. Uh, well, it, when you have a university job, that does seem to suggest that actually the left do, en enjoys a kind of hegemony within universities, by virtue of which people like Bannon and uh, others on the alt light are somewhat justified in feeling themselves marginalized. Well, I would say a couple of things. Um, you know, if you're talking about academics, you can you know, go ahead, feel free to draw on whatever source of inspiration for your work you see fit, you know. And there are certainly people on the, on the, on the far right. I would say Schmidt is a serious thinker. I would say Heidegger is a serious thinker and so forth. Um, but let me tell you this. I think, I think the analogy you draw is, is apt. Um, uh, Avola and uh, Dugan are... Uh, as radically opposed to liberal democracy as Mao or Lenin were. Mm. Uh, but but here's, here's the thing. I went looking when I wrote my book for websites with a Maoist or a Leninist in, uh, orientation. They do not exist in the United States. The days, the days when, uh, you know, uh, academics and young people uh, used to say, I'm a Maoist, I'm a liberal, I'm a Guvarist. It, it's it's long gone, and I would say in my in my experience, I mean, I've been I'm I, you know I'm not a, a, a globe trotter in academia, but I've had uh, some experience. I I I haven't run across a real live living breathing Maoist ever, you know. So now, now of course now, now let me just be clear. I haven't run across a real live living breathing Evolist in academ academia either. But what I would say is this, I would say, um, uh, if, 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 if you go out and you look for um, political outlets on the web that, are, that espouse anti-democratic right-wing ideologies, they're out there in force, okay? If the, and, the fact of, and the fact of the matter is that the platforms espousing anti-democratic left-wing ideologies, you know, uh, if, if they were ever around, you know, you could see uh, places like Ramparts used to say stupid things occasionally, right? And I remember when I was in high school, I used to read the East, what was it, the, 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 the East Side Rat, you know? So you, you could find these things. But nowadays, there is virtually nowhere on the web any kind of a uh, anti-democratic uh, left wing. There are people, you know, I mean, the, 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 the alt-right tries to point at people like uh, La Raza, 
and uh, Black Lives Matter as being the uh, alt left, right? And you say anything you want to about La Raza, you can say anything you want to about uh, Black Lives uh, Matter. Uh, and maybe they, you know, it, 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 these are, of course, uh, uh, ethnically based interest groups. Uh, they say some interesting things. They say some things that are foolish, like all the, none of them stand up and say, hey, you know what? White people are just, you know, inferior and, you know, the rule of law doesn't extend to them. None of them step forward and say, elections? Who needs elections? We need the great men of our race to lead it. There's, they're, they're really, I, I, I would, in fact, I think it's a very important conclusion of the book that doesn't exist in the West, a uh, left-wing opposition to liberal democracy. The, 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 the main opposition to liberal democracy in the West is coming from the right. I think that's true. That's, yeah. Although, you know, it could, well, first I would say that uh, I can think of people working in academia right now who are, who are at least, uh, widely read by academics such as Alan Badiou, who described themselves as Maoist, uh, and this is considered unproblematic. And secondly, I would say that, you know, people on the left, uh, like Stalin and Lenin, uh, were always, you know, nominally radically egalitarian, but the end result of their radical egalitarianism was the same as the end result of the radical authoritarianism of, you know, somebody like Hitler and Mussolini. So, you know, the fact that there isn't a, uh, an outspokenly anti-democratic movement on the left doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a kind of an alt-left or, or a kind of a, a left. Um, I, I, would say a couple, I would say a couple of things. Here yeah. and there you can find, you know, especially in France, where they still have this, you know, the, the current academic generation still remembers its salad days in 68, and so Maoism means something to them. But, but, but so you, you may find a few people. Like, by the way, I deplore them. I, you know, Maoism, I think you know, Leninism, Stalinism, is all of this is every bit as objectionable as the, uh, as the, the right-wing uh, anti-liberalism. I would simply say that by and large, and for the most part, in the West, these uh, left-wing illiberalisms are mostly a uh, spent force. Now, however, you can say, what you can say is this, you could make a rational argument. So for instance, for, for, it, it, it's true, I think, in the United States, people are now talking more about socialism and socialism is beginning to come, uh, become a, 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 a enter into the respectable political spectrum in the United States. Okay, now, but the people who, for the by and large, for the most part, the people who are socialists, like let's say Bernie Sanders, they're very uh, clear to explain. Oh, I'm talking about democratic socialism. Okay, yeah. now, and then there are some people who are rather, you know, more radical than that. You might look at, I mean, I guess you you could look at the American magazine magazine Jacobin which yes. is quite radical. Um, so I think you could look at these people and you could say, listen, okay, uh, you, for the most part, you're not you know, rejecting democracy and that's excellent. But you might be able to argue, hey, and you could, and you, you, you could, you could direct this style of, of criticism at the right too. You mm -hmm. could say to, 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 to mainstream socialists, you could say to mainstream conservatives, hey, wait a minute, okay. Uh, you want to, uh, let's say, direct this at the right. You want to cut back the welfare state. You don't like the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, and there are plenty of people on the right that, you know, attack the welfare state. Yeah. Uh, and there are plenty of people on the right who attack the welfare state who are not anti-democratic. But I would, I would, you know, I would probably say to them, listen, you know, you, you don't understand what you're, or you got to think this through more carefully. Really, a re real, real dismantling of the, the, the welfare states of the liberal democracies would substantially undermine uh, of, of the reality of, uh, of liberalism, broadly interpreted in the West. And you can make an argument like that against socialists. You can you can kind of make Hayekian arguments where you say, "Hey, re wait a second." If you're really talking about accumulating all that power in one place, there are going to be serious problems. That's certainly true. All that's true. But it is a world of difference 
between somebody who says, hey, I reject liberal democracy root and branch. I'm not into it, you know, and here is my alternative. That's one thing. And another thing is somebody who says, well, yes, of course, liberal democracy. Yes, that goes without saying. But then I've got all these brilliant ideas. And, and, and then and let's suppose that person in developing their brilliant ideas starts to get a bit incautious and kind of sort of loses track. That, that's too, you know, uh, uh, hypocrisy is the complement that uh, uh, vice plays to virtue. And when you're talking with somebody who uh, at least is giving lip service to the virtues, you're on a spectrum with that person. Mm. When you're talking to somebody who throws the liberal virtues, the democratic virtues, whatever, egalitarian virtues, kicks them out the window and says goodbye to all of that, now you have moved into a completely different uh, intellectual space. And that kind of intellectual space is found on the right these days. You don't find it on the left. Yeah, I mean, I did think the point was well made in your book about for all its short, about the fact that for all its shortcomings, you know, the alternatives being proposed by the right to liberal democracy are, you know, pretty obviously extremely dystopian. And yeah. now, now this is, uh, you know, I don't want to be Pollyannish. I'm, I'm working on a new book. Um, there are serious problems facing uh, liberal democracy. And, you know, to boil it all down, you know, I, I would say uh, the limitations of pluralistic politics, right? The difficulties that pluralistic politics and interest group politics have in generating public goods, okay, in uh, mobilizing interests that are hard to organize, in redistributing wealth as is necessary as a result of globalization, capitalist uh, creative destruction. Uh, liberal democracy, this is, these are serious problems. And I think in the United States, uh, we, we do need, um, uh, I, I would say, we need some serious uh, uh, constitutional reform, not, not just in the sense of, you know, the, the written constitution has been changed, but there's a number of things that need to be done uh, in, in the American political system to uh, uh, control, to cease to incentivize the propensity to divide up into factions and bargain, 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 bargain endlessly. I think, and I'm, I'm, and there are you know various ways that uh, that could be done. So I don't want to give the impression that like, everything is hunky dory with liberal yeah. democracies, and all we have to do is sit sit back and wait for these crazy kids to you know to to, to, to grow up. Well, some some of them have grown up already, and they're still crazy. But um, if there's there is hard work ahead uh, for uh, people who care about liberal democracies. There is. By the way, if, if, if you're interested in fighting, if you're interested in getting into arguments, if you're interested in saying things that will make your, your uh, grandfather at Thanksgiving, you know, open his eyes, and uh, uh, there's plenty of stuff like that, plenty of work like that to be done uh, for the purpose of uh, reviving and uh, optimizing liberal democracy. If, uh, if, you, if, if, if you insist on uh, getting a reputation for being a loudmouth, uh, want, don't bother becoming a loud mouth for the illiberal right. Why don't you become a loud mouth for liberal democracy? That, that's possible too. Okay, I think that's that's a uh, a good message on which to end the, uh, okay. the conversation. Um, Very good. Listen, thank you so much for having me. And uh, as uh, you know, I, I'm I'm very happy now to have uh, touched base with my uh, uh, my Irish uh, roots here in Cork. Huh? That's right. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. in Cork. Uh, for the moment, uh, although, as you know, I'm based in Siberia. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you so much, and um, keep you. Ireland great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, th thank you very much for right. doing this. Very good. Thank you. Uh,